We hold these truths. This is a program about the making of a promise and the keeping of a promise. This is a program about the rights of people. This is a program coming to you over the combined radio networks of the United States, bringing you the voices of Americans, bringing you the voice of the President of the United States. This is a program for listeners in all zones of continental time, for listeners on ships away from home, for listeners in uniform, for listeners on the American islands in the two great oceans. This is a program about the guarantee made to the people of America 150 years ago, a guarantee that has been kept through peace and war and peace and war. A guarantee we call the Bill of Rights. My name is Barrymore. I am one of several actors gathered in the studio in California and near shores that face an enemy across an ocean now Pacific in name only. We are here tonight to join 130 million fellow Americans in praise of a document that men have fought for, that men are fighting for, that men will keep on fighting for as long as freedom is a strong word falling sweet upon the ear. What we enact here tonight has been enacted many times before in living flesh and blood. The people we portray have walked the world. The drama is an ancient one. The endless one. The struggle for men's rights to live their lives out peacefully and profitably in a decent world. It may be many of us people here are known to many of you people there. For with us, honored to have a part in this program of commemoration are some whose names you may have heard. Such names as Edward Arnold, Walter Brennan, Bob Burns, Norman Corwin, Bernard Herman, Walter Houston, Marjorie Maine, Edward G. Robinson, Corporal James Stewart, loaned to us for this occasion by the Army Air Corps, Rudy Valley, and Orson Welles. In New York City, waiting to join us is Dr. Leopold Stokowski and the Symphony Orchestra. In Washington, the highest name in the land, the President of the United States, Commander-in-Chief of the Army and the Navy, Mr. Roosevelt. But this is not a night of names, of personalities. Our names or any names are meaningless unless your names are added. Unless you join us. You, for whom the sacred rites were written and to whom their keeping is entrusted. You, the guardians of what has been bequeathed to you by millions like yourselves and by the toil of centuries as dark and menacing as this we live in. You, the people of the Federated States. One hundred fifty years is not long in the reckoning of a hill, but to a man it's long enough. One hundred fifty years is a weekend to the redwood tree, but to a man it's two full lifetimes. One hundred fifty years is a twinkle to a star, but to a man it's time enough to teach six generations what the meaning is of liberty, how to use it, when to fight for it. Have you ever been to Washington, your capital? Been there lately? 
Well, let me tell you, it's a place of buildings and of boom and bustle, of the fever of emergency, of workers working overtime, of windows lighted late into the night. It's a handsome city, proud of its sturdy name, proud of the men who stopped there and made decisions, proud of its domes and lawns and monuments. Of course, Washington is like some other cities you've seen. It has streetcars, haberdasheries, newsstands, coffee shops and slums. At busy intersections, there are neon traffic signs, which, when the light's against you, say, Don't walk. And when the light changes, walk. It's a tourist city, which is proper when you think how much of history a busy guide can cover in a day. And when you realize that the District of Columbia belongs to all the people of the states. The tourists know that here their voices have been heard from clear back home. That here their boats are put to work. The tourists go to see the sights they've seen in a thousand pictures of, sights so famous and familiar that they're thrilled to find they look, well, they, they look just like they thought they looked. Washington Monument, for example, or the Lincoln Memorial, where the seated and relaxed Abe Lincoln sits between two mighty murals of plain words, his own words. With firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The city moves on busily outside the monument. The tourist goes to see the Capitol, the White House, the museums, sees all about him statues and inscriptions and more sayings than he's ever seen in his life before. They're wise sayings, profound sayings. At, at the Union Station, for example. A man must carry knowledge with him if he would bring home knowledge. Samuel Johnson. The Archives Building. What is past is prologue. The Supreme Court. Justice, the guardian of liberty. But one of the best is in the Library of Congress. The noblest motive is the public good, Virgil. Ah, the tourist thinks that over. The noblest motive is the public good. And with this in mind, he climbs the marble stairs inside the library to come at length upon a case containing a handwritten document. The engrossed original of the Constitution of the United States of America. He sees that the manuscript is aging, that its words are worn as though from use. The writing's dim. It's hard to make it out. It's getting on in years. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative The words are dim, granted, but not the meaning of the words. The, the pens the that put this down are dust, but not the marks they made. There was a time when this was shining parchment, when the text was easier to read, when the ink was not yet dry. Suppose that we stopped here in modern Washington before this shrine, were to return, go back, go back a little north by east in time and space to one bright afternoon in Philadelphia, that fine fall day when deputies from 12 free states subscribed their names to a new blueprint of a new society. And of the independence of the United States, the 12th, in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names, George Washington, President and Deputy from Virginia. <laughs> now, gentlemen, we are ready for your signatures by geographical progression north to south. The deputies from New Hampshire will please sign first. John Langdon. John Langdon. Nicholas Gilman. Nicholas Gilman. The delegates from Massachusetts. Good-looking men, these are mostly lawyers. Two or three of them surgeons. The gentleman from Connecticut, please. 
Broom there. Broom of Delaware. He did surveying for a while. Roger Sherman. And now our representative... Sherman, who just signed. He was a shoemaker before he studied law. The gentleman from New Jersey. That's Washington calling the delegation. David Brearley. David Brearley. The gentleman from... The man behind Ben Franklin is Alexander Hamilton. Ben's getting old now. 81. Hey, he slept off and on throughout the whole convention. But when it was important to be awake, he was awake all right and active. Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. Ah, there have been men assembled in a room before. But never to a greater purpose. The other. Well. Abraham Baldwin. Here comes the last to sign now. William Jackson, secretary. Well, now that's fine. Really, we're going to find this thing. So... So, the Constitution has been drafted, signed, and presently will be submitted to the states for their approval. Now, the convention's all relaxed now. There are handshakes, felicitations. Well, is everybody happy? Will they celebrate, do you suppose? Will Rufus King go home to Boston and be welcomed by a welcoming committee from the city? Will appreciative Virginians hoist James Madison on their shoulders and parade him through the streets? Shouting, Father of the Constitution, will a thumping band march up and down the town making a noise like this? No, there will be no band. And I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the heart of every man and woman, nay, of every child in each and every one of our 13 states, from the rock-bound shores of Maryland to the golden sands of Georgia, should fill and swell with pride on reading the noble and glorious Constitution which our wise and prudent and far-sighted representatives in solemn assembly have framed and admitted to our glorious states for their approval. And I say to you, no, there will be no speeches, there will be no celebration, no confetti from the windows, fireworks saluting cannon, roses strewn beneath the coaches of the delegates. Instead, suspicion. Suspicion by the very men who fought the long fight so that there could be a constitution drawn for the emancipated states farmers, and the clerks, and the hackmen, and the artisans, and the grease-grimed blacksmiths in their shops. These men who only lately put away their guns and powder in a good dry place. These men who won a war of freedom, but who know that freedom must be guarded to be kept. And they're suspicious, and they're talking in the common, in the tavern, and in the parlor, and in the foundry room. Mm-hmm. All right, what else does it say? Well, that covers it. That's the whole thing. Constitution. I don't like it. Why? Come here with me. Come over at the door. See that spire? Yeah. That's a church I go to. Well, what about it? I like it. I'm a God-fearing man. I want to keep on going there. Well? Don't want anybody telling me I have to pray his way. Well, who'd think of doing that? It's been done. It happened often. You ever hear state religion? Yes. Bad. I don't like it. Don't think we should have it. Well, we haven't got it. Nothing in that thing you read me guarantees we won't get it. You say this here Constitution gives us order and authority, huh? Yeah. But we had order and authority under King George before the Revolution. Shucks, the Romans had order and authority under Nero, too. Only the wrong kind and too much of it. Oh, yes, but surely you can trust the men oh, who... Ah, now, it ain't that I don't trust the men who wrote the Constitution. 
Oh, sure, I trust them, but them fellers won't always be around. Oh, yeah, well, you don't seem to understand. This is our own authority. Now, if you... Uh, the do... fact that it's our own don't make no difference. Constitution's fine as far as it goes. But the time to talk authority is after you put it down in black and white that we're all free men. Then we'll give you all the authority you need to keep us that way. What's more, we'll back it up with guns. Is that fair enough? Well, the way you talk, you'd think that... The way I talk? I think it all depends on who's handing out authority. Whether it's to keep men slaves or keep them free. Didn't think it was necessary. The English thought it was necessary a hundred years ago. They've got a Bill of Rights. Where's ours? Well, maybe they'll get around to that. Maybe they'll amend the Constitution later. How do we know they will? Well, maybe they're planning some... I don't like this maybe business. When my husband Robert got killed at Trenton, there was no maybe about it. He got killed. He knew what he was fighting for, and he was glad to die for it. Now the fighting's over. I want to see it. I don't know, Jerry... Sometimes I wonder whether you use your head for anything else than to keep your ears apart. I got my opinion, and I stick to it. The Constitution looks good to me. I don't think it needs no adding to. Hand me that brick there. It's a foundation, that's what it is. Sure, it's a foundation. That's just what I'm talking about. But do you build a foundation and then go away and not build a house? Do you clear the woods and then let the ground go barren? Ah, piffle. Ah, the way you argue. Piffle, eh? Is that all you can say? Hand me that brick there. <laughs> What's the hurry? Give them time. It's not an easy job to get a new country running right. That's just the point. It's a lot easier to get it running wrong. Rights, 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 man. Can't you get that through your head? Why shouldn't rights be written into the Constitution just as much as rules on how to meet and when to vote and how much a senator should get paid? Not they alone. Not only little men like they whose names escape us, whose names will never be recalled. The men who left their bloody footprints in the snows of Pennsylvania and buried their comrades in a clearing back of a clump of evergreens. The little men who took it, gave it, stuck for the duration, saw it through. Not they alone are doubters, wondering and grumbling, no. There are big names, too. Names now bandied on the tongue, but later to be lustrous, later to be sainted. Tom Jefferson, George Mason, Jimmy Madison, Pat Henry. Ah, now, take Jefferson, for instance. You know what he says? The Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against any government on earth. I'll take Pat Henry. I cannot give my oath to support this Constitution without a Bill of Rights. I'll take Mason, a wealthy planter of Virginia who'd rather plant a seed of liberty than 20,000 acres of tobacco. A government to be lasting must be founded in the confidence and affections of the people. Without a Bill of Rights, this government will end either in monarchy or a tyrannical aristocracy. This Constitution has been formed without the knowledge of the people, and it is not proper to say to them, take this or nothing. Well, well then, the Constitution is in peril. This document, so handsomely engrossed in Philadelphia, there are doubts about it and suspicions. Will the states approve of it? Approve by ratifying? Will they throw it out? Or will they ratify providing certain changes will be made? The writing's fresh, still fresh upon the parchment. The text is clean, the ink is bold, the meaning clear... Only the worth of the Constitution is uncertain. All the points, the articles, the regulations are well put. But will they be well taken? The states decide. Not one man, two men, three men, but the states united. They decide. 
What says South Carolina? We ratify but offer four amendments. What says Massachusetts, where she stands? We ratify but offer nine amendments. New Hampshire, you. We ratify but propose 12 amendments. Rhode Island. We ratify but 21 amendments, please. North Carolina. 26 amendments and the Declaration of Men's Rights. Virginia. We ratify but we're suggesting 29 amendments and a Bill of Rights. New York. 33 amendments in full face and credit. And we ratify. Now, now, Congress may begin, may call itself First Congress, may go to work, may tackle the new job of running a democracy. But it has one thing to remember. A promise is a promise. The people have been promised changes, promised amendments, promised that their freedoms should be written down in black and white for all to see, for all to know, for all to live and prosper by. Well, it'll take time. No quorum to begin with. Bad roads, New York City hard to get to. There's some indifference, too. So, well, days go by. No quorum. Month of March goes by. No quorum. Well... Patience. Good things grow slowly. Good things don't come running when you whistle to them. Good things are always fought for, worked for, grown. The acorn to the oak is not an overnight procedure, you know. God himself took several days to make the earth. But one day they begin. They sit down in a drafty hall in New York City and, and they go to work. At first they're busy with a hundred other things, but Madison, he, he keeps after them. He's a stickler for this Bill of Rights. Madison remembers what the people want. And by this time, carpenters are making changes in Federal Hall, adding more room. Now, the place has got to be enlarged. The government's growing. You know. And the representatives, all 55 of them, they work through the noise. They're making some additions of their own. They're working on the Bill of Rights. Do you think 55 representatives of the American people sat in a hall in New York City, in a drafty hall, and made up articles of freedom? Do you think the congressmen from 13 states made up those freedoms out of their own heads, debated there, deliberated there without assistance, all by themselves, from their own experience? Oh, no. They had much help from many nameless and unknown, from dust in quiet places, from broken bones deep in the earth, deep in forgotten earth, mixed with the empty clay, from bleeding mouths, burnt flesh, cropped ears, from numberless, and nameless agonies. The delegates from dungeons, they were there. I said that men were born equal. That is all I said. The delegates from ashes at the bottoms of the stakes, they were there. The king did not approve. The gallows delegates, whose corpses lifted gently in the breeze, they too... The exiled wanderers, the Christians killed for being Christians, Jews for being Jews, the Quakers hanged in Boston town, they made a quorum also. Present, we are present. The murdered men, the lopped off hands, the shattered limbs, the red welts, where the whiplash bit into the back. Must you know what they said? Must you know how they argued? Must you be told the evidence, the silent testimony of the rays? Must it be told verbatim? Listen then! <laughs> 
That was an argument for an amendment. <laughs> that was a speech in favor of an article of freedom. <laughs> that prayed the passage of a Bill of Rights. How much of all this must be told to be believed? Must it be drawn on diagrams? X marks the spot where decency was last observed. A dotted line shows how the victim staggered. The arrow points to blood. The headsman, he was there in Federal Hall. The man who turned the ratchets on the rack. He sat in the assembly too. Nero was there. Caligula. King Philip. Torquemada. Cotton Mesa. All the tyrants and the martyrs who had gone before. Sat quietly. Unseen among the representatives. Read from their memoirs expert testimonies found their ways into the records and between the lines. All the long and bloody history of fanaticism, murder in the name of God, torture in the name of love, crucifixion in the name of safety to the crown. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He, too, sat in the Congress. The mild man with the scars in his hands and feet where the spikes went through. He was a consultant in the business at hand. Had he not died because the rulers of a realm denied free speech, was he not nailed up on a cross between two thieves because his preachments were considered treason? He, the Son of God, was he not executed over an issue of the rights of man? Make no mistake about it. He was there. He sat beside James Madison and Elbridge Gerry and John Page in Federal Hall. Unseen he was, but voting. The men of Congress were collaborated with. They added up the gains and losses and the brave words spoken and the brave song sung. They weighed the drawn and quartered flesh. They took into account the hemlock and the crucifix, the faggot and garrot. And then they framed amendments to the Constitution. Out of the agonies out of the crisscross scars of all the human race, they made a bill of rights for their own people, for a new, a willful, and a hopeful nation. Made a bill of rights to stand against the enemies within, connivers, Takers, those who lust for power, those who make of their authority an insolence. The Congress of the 13 states, instructed by the people of the 13 states, threw up a bulwark, wrote a hope, and made a sign for their posterity against the bigots, the fanatics, bullies, lynchers, race-haters, the cruel men, the spiteful men, 
The sneaking men. The pessimists. The men who give up fights that have been just begun. The Congress wrote a ten-part epic of amendments. Amendment one. Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Radburn. I move this amendment be accepted in its present form without qualification. These are the voices of Virginians. We are debating Congress's amendment on this mild December afternoon, this 15th of December, 1791, debating in the State Assembly in the capital at Richmond. Only one more state is needed now to ratify. Just one more state and the amendment becomes law. Ah, the victory is close at hand. Virginia likes these articles. Virginia, the home of Washington and Jefferson, of Madison and Mason. Virginia has fought to win these rights for many years, has waited for this day. This is December the 15th, 1791. Virginia will ratify the Bill of Rights today, and freedom will take hold, take root, begin to burgeon in the rich earth of America. Today, today, the 15th of December. the people of the states breathe easier. It's all down in black and white. A contract. It's a deal between the future and themselves. Americans don't make a promise lightly, or take it that way either. A promise made by honest men to other honest men is like a hand clasp and a vow, meant to be understood, meant to be remembered. Ah, look. Look about the country now. Suspicion thaws like frost beneath the frank diplomacy of spring. The people read the new amendments slowly, pleasurefully, as, as they'd read a letter from a son just set up in business who'd written home to tell how he was making good. Oh, well, now that's more like it. Yes, sir, that's more like it. Got your sleeve in the soup, dear. What's more like what? Listen to this. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That mean you can keep your gun? That means if somebody gets into office and turns sour on the people that put him there, why, he can't vex us with a standing army the way George did before the war. No, sir, we people of the states, if we got arms, nobody's going to order us to do things the majority of the country ain't voted for. Not without a fight. Better eat that soup before it gets cold. Shouldn't read when you eat anyways. Put down the paper. Oh, all right. That's a good law, ain't it, Jasper? Yep. Go on, go on reading it. Why'd you stop? Well, how can you hear me when you're hammering? Concentration. Go on. Amendment three. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. (laughs) Gives me elbow grease just hearing things like that. Makes the old hammer handle easier. Hmm. The way this sounds, you'd think we was expecting another war. In a time of war, this says. Why, I thought we'd just been all through that a little while ago. Why, the more these amendments make us free, the more they'll be hated by those who don't want freedom because it spoils their game. Think nobody's going to try and break us up because we're united and agreed? (laughs) Some people are just ornery that way. Wouldn't surprise me none if we had to fight more wars. Why, you mean to say we, we're maybe going to have to fight all over again to keep our independence? Well, I hope it don't get to be a habit. I hope it does. Pretty good habit to get into, fighting for your rights. 
Always somebody waiting for a chance to steal valuables. And if freedom made a valuable, I don't know what is. Yeah, well... All right, go on, go on, read some more. Amendment 4. The rights of the people to be secure in their persons, homes, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be... Shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath and affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seen. I brought you these robbers. I grew them myself inside the house. Don't smell much, but. They're awful pretty. Everything's going on about the same at the house. Except I'm a year older since I was here last. Guess you don't have to worry anymore, Robert. Guess you can rest in peace now. Looks like it's going to be all right. They didn't trick you, Robert. Looks all right. The voices of Americans in Maryland, in Pennsylvania, Connecticut, the Carolinas, Georgia. Up and down the little seaboard nation, the voices of Americans together now. Together in a new way, in a strange new way, a way men had never lived together in before. Proud men, unsuspicious Trusting men, they're fighting over, and they're living just begun. They're building, and they're working, and they're singing, just now getting started. Here strangers from a thousand shores, compelled by tyranny to roam, shall find amid abundant stores a nobler and a happier home. Rejoice, Columbia sons, rejoice To tyrants never bend the knee But join with heart and soul and voice For Jefferson and liberty Here art shall live Does this song make good its promise? Does this folk tune hold the truth? Shall strangers from a thousand shores be compelled by tyrannies to roam? Shall they find here, amidst abundant stores, a nobler and happier home? One hundred fifty years from this beginning, how much of what is said and of what is sung and what is written down shall still be good? This parchment of the Bill of Rights, with the word resolved so plainly written on it, how long will it endure? Is it a passport to a greater day? Will future generations read it, sanction it, and pass on it? Will children's children live by it, work by it, and profit by it? Look it over. Look it over. It is new. The parchment shines. The text is easy reading. The words are not yet worn with trial and experience. The writing's fresh. The meaning's clear. Parchment gleams in the December sun like, like a burnished shield upraised against oppression. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life and limb. Nor shall he be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without... Let's go ahead 150 years from now. Let's rush headlong, unstopping down the corridors of time. Let's go ahead to 1941. The writing dims. The parchment cracks and curls up at the edges. The splotch of time is on it. And now it's in a case in Washington, D.C. It's in a case behind a pane of special glass protecting it from the light. You see that tourist bending over it there? He's, 
He's trying hard to make out the writing. He's tracing the rights of persons accused of crime. Amendment 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Where does this tourist come from? Oh, maybe from a place undreamed of when the Bill of Rights was born. A land as far away from Federal Hall as Europe. Well, California. What lies tonight between that place and here? Four dozen states without a yard of fenced-in border. A hundred thirty million people. People working, people resting up to work some more. People working in a mighty unison to prosecute a war. All right, now let's, let's uh, move along. Let's move among them. Let's hear them living lives and thinking thoughts and giving off opinions. Let's see now what they have to say 150 winters after Richmond. Let's see what happens to the Bill of Rights through their 33 administrations. 77 Congresses and a half a dozen wars. Has anybody anything to say about the status of men's rights December 15th, 1941? I have something to say, if you don't mind. I'm in jail tonight, but I'm joining in your celebration and cheering as hard as anybody else. Uh Uh-huh. Well, uh, if you don't mind my asking, uh, what... Well, a trumped-up charge. The old routine in the city. But I'm getting out on bail tomorrow, and when I'm finally tried, it'll be by a jury and in public. None of this Gestapo stuff. Not that they wouldn't try it if they could, but that little 450-word matter you're celebrating tonight stops them short of that. Yeah, well, what did they chuck you in the clink for? I mean, what the charge? For... Making a speech for the fusion party against the mayor. First, we hired a hall. But they took away our permit. Said the building was unsafe under an old fire ordinance. <laughs> so then we went down to Garrison Square, where no permit is required to speak in public. And within ten minutes, we were on our way to the police station on charges of blocking traffic, disturbing the peace, and inciting to riot. Oh, it's a fine thing. Yes, but listen, we'll beat him. He's scared of us. He's scared the people will find out the truth. And with good reason, because when they do, he's finished. That's why he doesn't want us to be heard. Uh Uh-huh. It's only the crooks and the frightened little big shots who need to shut up their opponents. That may work all right in some other countries, but not here. Yeah, well, how are you going to beat him? Well, there's such things as rights on our side. And not even the mayor's machine is powerful enough to stop us. We'll fight that fight on every front. Carry it to the highest courts if necessary. And we'll win! Is this the talk of servile men? Of tamed and gutless and obedient men? Is this the kind of talk you hear from slaves and witless followers... No, not quite. Not exactly. This is what they meant in Federal Hall and what they voted for 150 years ago today in Richmond. Those Ten Amendments are not dusty statutes loafing in retirement. They're a pep talk to the fighters and a fortress to the undefended. They double-bar the front door of the home against culprits and searching parties. Stand the drinks for everybody toasting freedom. And of all things, they are not a set of legal clauses, dry and dusty. Uh, although that, that Amendment 7, that makes us wonder. Amendment 7, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20 the right of trial shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Uh Uh-huh, well, except for that, not like a lawyer's brief at all, but mostly, mostly like a kind of a freestyle ode to liberty. Ten verses long. Amendment 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. That's treason in most of Europe sentiment like that today. Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights 
shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Do you, do you notice? Do you notice how many times it says the people? Well, now, can it be because it means the people? Yeah, it can. Amendment ten: The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Powers reserved to the people in the Bill of Rights. <laughs> How the mighty and the proud have fallen! Why, King John, who threw a fit when barons made him sign the Magna Carta. Barons, mind you, were heedless of the common people. John, the tough old monarch. Well, he would have died a thousand deaths of apoplexy at the mention of the thought of it. The pharaohs of old Egypt, masters of the blackest arts of slavery, they would have crawled inside a pyramid and shut 147 secret doors behind them in a panic. A promise is a promise. Has America's been kept? Has it come through peace and war and peace and war untarnished and unbroken? Has it worked, and is it working for the people and by the people? Is it going anywhere from here? Are the rights the right rights? Are they rolling? Do they function? Do they click? Well, who knows the answer better than the people? Who better can we ask than ask the great custodians themselves, the hundred million keepers of the promise? And we shall ask them. Ask a few of them who stand for many more than few. The high and the low among them. Ladies and gentlemen, an office clerk. Well, <clears throat> we know what freedom is now. Look for a while there, like a lot of us had forgot what it really meant and how much we had of it. But the news that kept piling in from the four corners of the earth <laughs> that reminded us all right. Ladies and gentlemen, an editor. There have been attacks on the freedom of the press and strangleholds of various sorts, but they've been broken every time, and today a man is free to start a paper, run it as, as, run it as he pleases, differ from the next man, all he wants. That would make it seem to me, for one, that our rights have come down on damage. Ladies and gentlemen, a worshiper. I go to the church of my choice, and sometimes when I don't wish to go, I don't go. Ladies and gentlemen, an auto worker. We got the right to organize. We got the right to bargain collectively. Those are good rights, and we're proud of them, and we're better workers on account of them. Ladies and gentlemen, a manufacturer. There is nothing in any law which forbids us to forget class differences and work together to strengthen the sinews of our country. Ladies and gentlemen, an okey. I got a right, if I'm hungry and out of work, which I has been, to go looking for work anywhere in my country. The big court says nobody can't stop me from looking. Dang it, that's my right. Ladies and gentlemen, a mother. I might be afraid to bring a child into the world, but not to bring a citizen into the population of the United States. Yes. And from men beneath the rocking spars of fishing boats in Gloucester, from the vast tenancy of busy cities, roaring with the million mingled sounds of work, from towns spread thinly through the Appalachians, from the assembly lines, the forges spitting flame, the night shifts in the mines, the great flat counties of the prairie states, from the grocers, from the salesmen, from the tugboat pilots and the motor makers, affirmation, yes, united proudly in a solemn day, knit more strongly than we were 150 years ago this day. Can it be progress? If our Bill of Rights is stronger now than when it was conceived, is that not what you would call wearing well? The incubation of invincibility? Is not our Bill of Rights more cherished now than ever? The blood more zealous to preserve it whole? Americans shall answer, for they alone may know the answer. The people of America, from the east, from west, from north, from south. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the President of the people of the United States. Free Americans. No date in the long history of freedom means more to liberty-loving men in all liberty-loving countries than the 15th day of December, 1791. On that day, 150 years ago, a new nation, through an elected Congress, adopted a Declaration of Human Rights which has influenced the thinking of all mankind from one end of the world to the other. There is not a single republic of this hemisphere which has not adopted in its fundamental law the basic principles of freedom of man and freedom of mind enacted in the American Bill of Rights. There is not a country, large or small, on this continent and in this world which has not felt the influence of that document directly or indirectly. Indeed, prior to the year 1933, the essential validity of the American Bill of Rights was accepted everywhere, at least in principle. Even today, with the exception of Germany, Italy, and Japan, the peoples of the whole world, in all probability four-fifths of them, support its principles, its teachings, and its glorious results. But in the year 1933, there came to power in Germany a political clique which did not accept the declarations of the American Bill of Human Rights as valid. A small clique of ambitious and unscrupulous politicians whose announced and admitted platform was precisely the destruction of the rights that instrument declared. Indeed, the entire program and goal of these political and moral tigers was nothing more than the overthrow throughout the earth of the great revolution of human liberty of which our American Bill of Rights is the mother charter. The truths which were self-evident to Thomas Jefferson, which have been self-evident to the six generations of Americans who followed him, were to these men hateful. The rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which seemed to the founders of the Republic, and which seemed to us inalienable, were to Hitler and his fellows empty words which they propose to cancel forever. The propositions they advanced to take the place of Jefferson's inalienable rights were these, that the individual human being has no rights, whatever, in himself and by virtue of his humanity, that the individual human being has no right to a soul of his own or a mind of his own, or a tongue of his own, or a trade of his own, or even to live where he pleases, or to marry the woman he loves. That his only duty is the duty of obedience, not to his God, not to his conscience, but to Adolf Hitler, and that his only value is his value not as a man, but as a unit of the Nazi state. To Hitler, the ideal of the people as we conceive it, the free, self-governing, and responsible people is incomprehensible. The people, to Hitler, are the masses, and the highest human idealism is in his own words that a man should wish to become a dust particle of the order of force which is to shape his universe. To Hitler, the government as we conceive it is an impossible conception. The government to him is not the servant and the instrument of the people, but their absolute master and the dictator of their very act. 
To Hitler, the church as we conceive it is a monstrosity to be destroyed by every means at his command. The Nazi church is to be the national church, a pagan church, absolutely and exclusively in the service of but one doctrine, one race, one nation. To Hitler, the freedom of men to think as they please and speak as they please and worship as they please is of all things imaginable most hateful and most desperately to be feared. The issue of our time, the issue of the war in which we are engaged is the issue forced upon the decent self-respecting peoples of the earth by the aggressive dogmas of this attempted revival of barbarism. This proposed return to tyranny, this effort to impose again upon the peoples of the world doctrines of absolute obedience, of dictatorial rule, of the suppression of truth, of the oppression of conscience, which the free nations of the earth have long ago rejected. What we face is nothing more nor less than an attempt to overthrow and to cancel out the great upsurge of human liberty of which the American Bill of Rights is the fundamental document to force the peoples of the earth and among them the peoples of this continent and this nation to accept again the absolute authority and despotic rule from which the courage and the resolution and the sacrifices of their ancestors liberated them many, many years ago. It is an attempt, an attempt which could succeed only if those who have inherited the gift of liberty had lost the manhood to preserve it. But we Americans know that the determination of this generation of our people, our generation to preserve liberty, is as fixed and certain as the determination of that earlier generation of Americans was to win it. We will not, under any threat or in the face of any danger, surrender the guarantees of liberty our forefathers framed for us in our Bill of Rights. We hold with all the passion of our hearts and minds to those commitments of the human spirit. We are solemnly determined that no power or combination of powers of this earth shall shake our hold upon them. We covenant with each other before all the world that having taken up arms in the defense of liberty, we will not lay them down before liberty is once again secure in the world we live in. For that security we pray. For that security we act now and evermore. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard the President of the United States speaking from the White House in Washington, D.C. Our national anthem.
You have been listening to We Hold These Truths, a special program commemorating the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights and presented over the combined radio networks of the United States. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt spoke from the White House in Washington, D.C. The Hollywood portion of the program, written and directed by Norman Corwin, starred Edward Arnold, Walter Brennan, Bob Burns, Walter Houston, Marjorie Maine, Edward G. Robinson, Corporal James Stewart, Rudy Valley, and Orson Welles. The original music score was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. The national anthem was performed by the NBC Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Dr. Leopold Stokowski, and came to you from New York. <laughs>